Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new and improved How Did We Get Here? If you watched us last year, we produced a series of videos on YouTube with the Daily Coast YouTube channel discussing one issue pretty quickly in about five minutes, and then we would move on. In 2021, we are going in a different direction. And How Do We Get Here is now a weekly podcast where every month we unpack all of the little minutia of one specific issue and talk about how things can get better, talk about who's disproportionately affected, talk about what the issue really is. So we're starting off right away here in the month of March talking about student debt forgiveness, which is a surprisingly polarizing issue, even among the most progressive of Democrats. To me, that's unbelievably shocking. That said, at the core of this conversation, there seems to be a lot of misinformation regarding what the problem really is at hand, who is most affected by it, and what are the real steps that we could take moving forward to remedy what is a giant economic crisis. In a lot of these conversations, there's a general disinterest around the issue and a lack of empathy, because frankly, a lot of this is a generational divide. The American higher education system wasn't as fundamentally broken as it is now for a lot of its existence, and borrowers weren't taking out as much money as they need to now. So what is the crisis? How big is the problem? Why should everyone care about it? And how do we get here? So how big is the problem? Around 44 million Americans currently owe $1.5 trillion in student debt. In addition to having more borrowers, the total amount owed has more than doubled up to 250% from 600 billion to 1.5 trillion in the last 10 years. And the rate of delinquency over 90 days has doubled to about 11% nationwide. After World War II, when the United States made the investments of putting an entire generation of soldiers in higher education, we saw the biggest economic boom that this country has ever seen. The narrative around post-World War II's economy often seems to leave that out quite a bit. What followed was public education providing higher learning at little to no cost to students. So we fast forward to the 70s, and we actually have a pretty lucrative and amazing public education system here in the United States. The University of California system, for example, was hailed as one of the greatest education achievements worldwide. Because of the success of these incredible public universities being able to provide affordable to free education to a wide swaths of Americans, private colleges, including many of the Ivy League schools, saw themselves struggling to compete with public schools and frankly began to lobby Congress. A lot of it is emotional bias and private college graduates trying to save their own alma maters in Congress. It's nepotism, to be honest. And so out comes the 1972 Higher Education Act, which is the sort of market approach. So then the student aid is directly given to students rather than to universities, allowing students to choose between public, private, or for-profit schools. At this time, I think it's important to point out that Democrats were actually pretty large proponents of for-profit universities. We'll get to that. What ended up happening was that trade school students started defaulting on their loans. And because of this 1972 law that passed, this voucher system, it made it so that states would have to allocate their own education budgets, which was an easy item for them to slash year after year after year. There's a lot of research that shows that states cutting down their funding is the number one reason that tuition rates have gone up so drastically. This is where a lot of the generational divide around student debt really centers. I was born in 1990, and my parents are both baby boomers. If my parents had been born in the United States and gotten their college education in the United States, they would have gotten an extremely affordable education. Right now, you see the rhetoric on the Hill from representatives and senators discussing how they were able to go to college through having a part-time job able to pay their tuition. The average rate of borrowing throughout the 70s and even through some of the 80s were 10% of what students are borrowing today. Not to mention the fact that in today's workforce, not having an education is a drastic disadvantage economically. Not to mention the fact that salary and wages haven't particularly increased tenfold the way that tuition and fees have, and the fact that nationwide the cost of living has increased rapidly. There's also this complete misconception that student loan is an ivory tower issue. 
by which I mean that it is something that only affects the highest earners in our society. The data tells a different story. 40% of borrowers who have outstanding debt right now did not graduate from college. That's not an insignificant number. The conversation then also tends to devolve into discussing that college isn't for everyone. Something that in actuality usually turns into college not being accessible to people in poverty. The reality is that college isn't equally accessible across all socioeconomic backgrounds in this country. And often people who choose to go to trade schools do so out of circumstance, not out of choice. There's nothing wrong with going to a trade school. However, the most successful trade schools tend to be community colleges, which are wildly underfunded. And then there's the additional issue of for-profit colleges. For-profit universities saw this huge boom in the 2000s to the early 2010s fueled a lot by this rhetoric of people need to go to trade schools because this trade schools that were readily accessible for people who would be interested in attending one were the University of Phoenix's DeVry University Trump University scams. These schools qualified for government funding, were often understaffed, and spent over 20% of their budget on marketing tactics. There's been a lot of research and studies done on for-profit universities, and rightfully there's been a significant crackdown on them. You don't see these universities being as loud and proud as they once used to be, but that doesn't mean that for-profit universities don't continue to create a problem. There's not been a lot of research done regarding coding camps and a lot of these universities that exist now that target students who want to go into the computer fields or into a STEM career. But preliminary research into these coding boot camps shows that they also come at too high of a cost for too little of a return for many students and could end up being as disastrous when it comes to defaulting on loans as the for-profit universities of the early 2000s. Next week, we're going to discuss how student loans disproportionately affect people of color, first-generation students, veterans, and the working poor. We'll get into the racial and gender dynamics at play in higher education and in access to higher education. But while we're on the topic of for-profit universities, it is so important to point out that in their practices, they specifically targeted people of color, veterans, and the working poor. And in many cases, when people weren't able to continue paying for these programs or finish them, they ended up being in a much worse financial situation than they were when they first started. Student debt is an extremely complex issue, and we will continue delving into this for the following month. But as you can see with all these moving pieces, the language of not making college accessible to all has fueled a significant portion of this problem. Personally, I'm alarmed by listening to members of my party and so-called progressives using the same language of conservatives and the Republican Party when it comes to the student debt issue. Many folks who oppose the cancellation of student debt will use the pull yourself up from your own bootstraps language that is often hurled at Democrats when discussing affordable health care options, minimum wage reform, food stamps, homelessness, and other economic issues that we as a party are supposed to be champions of. And especially after coming off of four years of Donald Trump, I don't know about you, but I'm personally invested in making sure that we have as educated a populace as possible. If you'd like to tune in next week, be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in next week as we continue discussing student debt reform and what changes we can make to create a more equitable society. I'm Kara Zelaya, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. See you next week.